Pero sí se escucha, ¿no? no perfecto. Vale, muy buenas tardes a todos, ya son las 5, no, las 4 de la tarde, sábado en Barcelona, hace un calor de la hostia afuera y vosotros aquí enganchados, aquí dentro, a escuchar a un tío de Strongly Tight Languages y uh, Dynamic Schemas, sois unos campeones, sí señor. <risa> Barcelona por la tarde, un sábado, a venir a escuchar cosas de Java, muy bien. Uh, Bien hecho. La playa también se está bien, ya os digo. Hoy vamos a hablaros de un par de cosas que a lo mejor no son muy, no son muy comunes, por lo menos de un, de un punto de vista de una conferencia de Java pura y dura. Aquí, seguramente en estos dos días habéis visto mucho código Java, muchos tools alrededor de Java, muchas formas de hacer diferentes tipos de cosas utilizando librerías de Java, plataformas, Docker, sistemas de distribución, un montón de cosas que nos hacen hacer nuestro trabajo mecánico de poner cosas en marcha bien. Pero lo que os hoy voy a hablar un poquito de cómo organizar nuestros datos utilizando por un lado nuestros lenguajes de programación que nos gustan mucho, que son Strongly Typed o Statically Typed Languages, con flex, uh, bases de datos de sistemas flexibles, como puede ser, por ejemplo, MongoDB. By the way, I don't know if I need to do it in English. Yeah? In English, right? So all the things that I've said before, you know it, so um, I'll, I'll keep on doing it. We're going to talk about strong type languages with flexible schemas. We're also going to talk about uh, how to deal with uh, schema changes, change management, how we deal with those, because if there's something crucial about your applications in today, and nowadays uh, uh, programming methodologies like agile methodologies will imply a lot of changes. So be prepared for that and what kind of things should we be aware of when we're working with strongly typed languages and, and flexible schemas. And we're also going to be looking into some trade-offs around what kind of things do we gain if we use a, a certain type of um, methodology, a certain type of strictness or a flexibility in your code. So let's start with a little definition about strongly typed languages because if you go and look into the internet, you'll see a lot of different uh, variations of this definition. It's not a hard, hard, concrete definition of this. And I chose this one because it's much more related with what the kind of languages that you guys use. Uh, unless you are in the JVM uh, languages of all the dynamic things like JRuby, um, Groovy, and JPython, or Jiton, or whatever, then you can have, or Ceylon, for example, you can have a lot more flexibility there. But I'm going to strict we're going to get stick to this ones, which are generally the ones that we can interpret very well. They are, for example, our Java, our C++, or even your Go language. Okay, so this is where we're going to scope them around. Obviously, this is a, JC, a JBC, a JVCN conference, so we're going to be mostly looking to Java. And then we have flexible uh, databases and flexible schemas, and how can we deal with such a from one side strongly typed languages with something that actually can be completely different. Whatever is on the database, it's the truth, and whatever we want to manipulate data on will actually be changed. In traditional relational databases, we have a lot more boundaries. We have a lot more restriction on how we deal with data and how we organize this data. Uh, we start by defining our uh, table, for example, where we strictly define what do we want to store what kind of data types those, those pieces of information will have, and this will be bounding the way that our application will be built. Based on this, we have our table definition, and then we have our constraints, our column structure. We can even go further, and we can say, well, you know, I'm going to create not only a table, but I'm also going to tell the system what kind of data I really, really need to have, and how does all of this information relate with each other. And then we're going to have a lot of checks on the database. The database will do a lot of the, let's say, validation that what I'm sending it to actually is corresponding with the rules by which I want the data to be structured. I'm going to have my foreign keys. I'm going to have my unique keys. I'm going to make sure that those foreign keys exist on the different table. I can make sure that some of the data is not null. All of those things will be forced in or not say forced, but will be 
strictly defined in how the baseline of my data structures. Everyone knows this, correct? Everyone knows that we can even extend this further and have a lot more types and checks. And then we ended up with this kind of pictures, where we define on a good diagram how we relate the different code or the different entities with each other. In this previous example, we have going to be very simple, users and cat pictures. Everyone knows that. This is how Facebook makes money, and this is how they define their schemas. That's all good, right? But then we need to ask ourselves one particular question. Is this flexible? And this particular system over there is, the previous one, is quite simple, right? Two tables, one relationship between them, that's fine. But let's think about how we're going to evolve this code, because this is where we want to really focus. What kind of new fields are we going to add up to the system? Are we going to be strict with this? Are, are these the only fields that we're ever going to be needing to you know, have a viable product that people actually use? Do I need to extend this further? How about how do I organize the data in between? What kind of data structures I'll have? Are they always going to be flat, like the previous ones, where we're going to have a table and then another table and I can always link them? Or are we going to manipulate hierarchical shapes, like embed documents and embed structures that can, might, or might not be there once I have my application up and running? And also, are these types always the same for all different entities? Or am I going to have a lot of polymorphism? which one field might be a string, another field might be an integer, and they happen to have the same name. Am I going to store different shapes on the same collection or the same, same table? I'm going to manipulate them in the same way. These kind of things are quite important. And also, because scalability is a problem today, and a lot of people try to uh, solve that, is how am I going to need to scale this? If I have a one-to-end -one kind of structure that is scalable, if I always use the same one relationship kind of table, or if I have a gazillion cat pictures in one single user, or if I have gazillion users times gazillion cat pictures, how is this all going to behave once I need to find a user and find all these cat pictures? We need to think about if this data structure actually allows us to scale out very, very well. Today we have options. We have, obviously, the, our pure traditional relational systems that work fine for a lot of use cases. Everyone learns how to do them and how to use them. They are not going to go away, and they shouldn't, because they fit the problem, a subset of problems, or a large majority of problems, very, very well. But today we also have options. We have document-oriented databases, we have graph databases, and we have key value stores. And all of these have a thing in common. They offer a lot more flexibility. They don't impose so many constraints. We are going to particularly use document oriented databases because it's web scale. Uh, apart from being web scale, this is where I, who I work for, so it makes sense. What are the um, traditional um, things that flexible schemas allows us to do? Well, first of all, they do not restrict us in a specific schema. They do not have a mandatory validation of the structures that we're going to add up to. If we are constructing a graph database, and if we want to add nodes to our graph node, we don't care so much on the number of uh, variables that we're going to have on per each node. We just want to store them very quickly, and we want to find them very quickly. Same thing goes for key value stores. The only thing a key value stores restrict us to do is having a key that I can identify with the value. That value, whatever I want, I can just store it in. Kind of the same thing happens with the document-oriented databases, but with much structure. Not only we have a restriction on a key, because every single database in every single table needs to have a primary key, that's laws of physics, but also gives us a little bit more structure, and they relate better with our program-oriented databases. They reflect a little bit much closer the way that we interpret data on our code. So pretty much when we're using one of these things, we are ready to start thinking about code. And this is where we start. And this is why developers like to use these databases so much. We do not need to think how our data is going to be strictly defined in our database. We define our code, and then we optimize, and then we store it. So we end up probably if you're using a document in the database, something like this. Sorry about the name, Juan Olivo. I don't know why I made up this name. I know I have a friend of mine that works at Mongo that his last name is 
Olivo, but no Juan, no particular reason. Uh, I don't know. Maybe San Juan. I, I don't know. But we'll see a lot during the presentation. So you can't really see that, that well. I'm sorry for the uh, glare on the screen. But basically, you can work with something that is like this. We have Juan. He has some cat pictures. On the cat pictures, we have the definition of the size of the picture and the actual binary content. Why is this so great? Well, it is a way of defining data, which allows us, for example, in Mongo, to define rich data types. We don't not restrict it to just JSON flat uh, five different data types like number, string, null, array, object, and boolean. We have much more richer data types in the database, which is good because we don't want to always just find by matching value. We also want to be doing calculations, uh, um, uh, segmental information. We want to make sure that the data that I'm going to store is bigger and greater and, and range-based and all those kind of calculations. We need pureness of data. And also going to have you know, embed doc the document structures that allows us to go further in our definition of our entities, which are much more aligned with the ways that we interpret it and manipulate it from, that, from code. But there are some challenges, and it's easy for you to understand them. Well, first of all, we're going to have different versions of our documents. We will have a, as our application evolves, we will probably going to be adding up fields and structure and embed documents to our documents, to our classes. And we want to reflect that in our documents. Now, the question is, do we always need to make sure that everything in our database always follows the same rules, like in relational system? Because if you think about it in a relational system, if you want to add up a new field, what do you need to do? Alter table, add column x. And this, if you define a default value, will need to apply all that default value to all different entries, all different rows of, the, of that definition. It's not that, it's just a restriction. It needs to have that order. In this case, if we are using a flexible, document database, uh, a flexible schema database, we probably don't need that. Probably just need to affect the ones that are actually going to be needing those fields. That it's advantages, but also it's challenges. Different structures of our documents, not only the fields itself, or the names of the fields and the labels of the fields. Think about it, things that never happen, like I'm building a piece of, my, of code using direct access to the database and defining, oh, my class and my machine will be name underscore, a first underscore name. And you guys are building some set of other, of the other side of the code, some, the same kind of module, but you define the same entity instead of an underscore in the middle, you use capital, um, capital letter or camel case or straight case. And you define that exactly in your database. That never happened, right? Different names for, different, for the same variable, that never happens. Well, that happens and that happens a lot and we need to deal with that because in document databases, you have to define them. And also different value types for the fields like some value is a string for some people and manipulated by the string. And for some other people, it's an integer or a date or something weird that no one knows what it is. Anyway, those are the challenges, and we have ways of dealing with those. So when we have different versions, we might have some monotonically structure that allows us to represent the way ever going in the same way. Like, we have a first version which starts with the first name Juan, and then we have a second version which we added up a new field called last name, which is corresponding value, and here we added up the cat picture. Does this ever happen in your application? It does, right? And your document will evolve as your application will either add up that feature or actually the workflow of the application will set up those values. You do not need to strictly define this in the beginning. And you don't need to strictly define this field in the beginning as well. So how do we deal with this is quite important to understand. Documents also suffer times in their structure. So we're probably going to see this occurring over and over. The different structures of the documents. The different document can coexist in the same collection, for example, MongoDB. Or in a key value store, I have inside of the same collection as well, or same table, different documents or different structures where a key points to a, a, a particular structure and another key in the same order will also a completely different thing. 
this can happen as well. I have some user definition like Juan Olivo, and I have a car, which is Ford model in the date it was created. This can be done. In the same collection, you'll have different data structures. Now, my question for the architects in the, in the house, is this a good idea to use? Just like this. Just like having a completely data structure you know, blunged into a same single collection. Would that be a good idea? In general, it causes a lot of problems, especially in the complexity that we need to do when we want to iterate over these documents. It might be a good idea, for example, if they have a common root. Like, for example, if I needed to set up here a field called entity, and what I'm actually capturing is not particularly interested in these particular fields, but in entities that occur in a model or something that happens, like for example IoT, we have multiple of new different metrics around, flying around, and we just want to capture the information that those metrics, those signals have. Putting them all in one single collection probably is a good idea, but not in the vast majority of the cases. But this is also possible, so we need to think about the ways of dealing with that. And obviously, the d different types. Yeah. It's not a good idea. You are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. What I'm trying to say here is this, although it's not a good idea in most cases, in probably IoT, some particular cases like measuring, it's not even a good idea because you need to have some notion of what are you doing, and you can separate those into different collections. In this case, you should do that. You can still do that. And in some cases, might be easy to do. Just for capturing logs, for example, it can be a completely different structure every time a log comes in. There's always some common ground. There's always some structure in the documents that will actually give you a sense of what it is. All the information might be different. Good point. So we also have, for example, different definitions of dates. People tend to interpret dates in different ways. Sometimes a timestamp, sometimes it's a string, sometimes an ISO date. So how do we deal with this? Right? This can be a pain in the ass because in, that, in relational databases, you don't have this problem. But now that I have flexibility, actually, this might not be a problem, might be an advantage, but also needs to be well taken care of. So, it deals with change management. So change management in sometimes is around things that how am I going to version things so I can know what I'm dealing with? And in particular, object-oriented programming languages, how am I going to deal with class loading? I have my objects is defined, I have my classes defined, I have my polymorphism. How am I going to deal with you know, the injection of the, all this data? from the data layer, from the persistency layer, how am I organization of the data in raw metal, and how I'm going to transpose this to business logic. The impedance there needs to be handled. The same thing with the versioning, the same thing with the data structures. There are a few strategies in place. The first strategy that I put in here, I, I was thinking a lot around, am I going to put this first bullet point there or not? Because it's not a strategy for me. For me, it's a rule. You should always, always, always decouple your database from your business logic. And decoupling is not just creating a jar file or a library that deals with the DAO. It's actually removing access from the developer to actually even do any access to the database in the first place. No matter what the database we are storing. Key value store, relational databases, graph databases, doc doesn't really matter. If you couple, your application, you're going to have trouble, and we'll see a couple of things around that. We also have ODMs. They, they, different ODMs have different strategies, and we'll see a couple of the, uh, examples on how do they deal with this. Versioning, strategies to version our documents. Some document-oriented uh, document databases give it for free, MongoDB doesn't, so how are the structures in place that we can do or different strategies to deal with this? And data migrations, because let's face it, Sometime in our application, you will evolve faster than your data, and you'll need your data to keep track of what you're doing. You can all, not always live with very old versions of documents in your database. You will e eventually need to migrate that data somewhere. 
So decoupled architectures. Now, this is what I think of when we are dealing with coupled app architectures, which like super gluing everything. It's very strong. It can all be tested out of the box. Everyone knows exactly how things are done. And then you get into situations like this, where you try, you, you put it in your hair, and once you realize it's not a good hair, you're, you're, you're fucked. You can't just take your hands out of it. You have to deal with it. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It's one of the most stupid movies ever, but it's so cool. But this is the kind of situation you get into. Even though you try very hard, there's always going to be some part of your code that if you don't decouple, you will be stuck with it. And you will have to carry that technological debt all the way. Or it's going to be <laughs> needing to cut your fingers to get rid of it. So example of coupled applications is when your application, for example, you build one and it uses direct access to your application, your database, sorry. In Babs everything, the JDBCs, the MongoDB drivers, whatever you are using, and just does direct accesses, changes schemas, everything is controlled by the application. And then you decide to evolve and you have a second module, a second, uh, a second application that actually goes and calls some library inside your inner application. And you obviously, you have a colleague sitting next to you that is building their, his own Python thing and he's manipulating the same data that you are reading and writing and he's doing it for analytics purpose, for measurements, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But he also has access to that. So what happens when someone decides to make a schema design change? Does anyone know what happens? Well, application A will do fine. Application B and application C will be fucked because they will not, they will have conflicts over the way that your data is designed. And this is very, very hard to battle because once these guys can access this database, they are in control. And they are in control not only of how the data is structured, also in the control of how the way the data is defined and manipulated. So be careful about that. And this will be coming an iterative cycle because then this guy is going to say, okay, I'm going to roll back all your changes because I'm going to do a, a migration here. And then he's, the one is screwed. This one doesn't even know what happened because he's using some library here that he was expecting some format and eventually it starts work, it stops working. People get confused about it. So what you should be always be doing, and this is a rule. This is not a strategy. This is a rule. It's putting an API in the middle. Now, this API does not necessarily need to be the fancy new REST APIs, although they are there to fulfill this gap as well. But they can be any kind of API. It can be an inheritance. It can be a jar that you create that manipulates that, well-versioned, well-maintained, but separate from the workflows of the application. And then in this way, you have the capability of when this application needs to access the database, you can offer an interface that they know and that they can react if they change something, they will request those changes and not force you to do it. And you'll be completely aware of everything that touches your database, which is extremely, extremely important, especially on a shared modules environment. Be aware of that. There's a lot of things around it. I, I, I put a lot of bullet points here. It allows better business logic handling. It allows you to decouple the underlying storage engine in an effective way. So you can easily change the storage persistency layer if you want to. You just need to deduplicate whatever baseline application access you are doing. Changes are requested and not imposed on the schema directly. And it allows you to better versioning control. Now, ODMs. I sometimes, especially in Java I, conferences, I tend to um, work a lot or talk a lot about ODMs. And I think, I don't know if you ever read a blog post out there, which is ODMs are the Viet Vietnam of programming languages. You should look for it. It's crazy. And it's true. And basically, ODMs, I hate them. But they fulfill a good, some good purposes. Like reducing patterns between the code and the database. It's a direct one. I don't need to create my DAO. I just create POJOs, reference them, and I let this library take care of it, right? 
is a data management, data management facilitator, hides complexity from operators, tries to decouple business complexity into with magic recipes like in injection and um, uh, how do you call it? I see the word uh, inference and all those things that in Java you can do that very very well. So we have, for example, Spring Data, which is far far well known, correct? Everyone knows here Spring Project. Who loves Spring Project? You guys love it? Oh, God. Wrong crowd. So um, Spring Data is one of the components of Spring that allows you to have different modules. One of them is different databases as well. And you can use them in a POJO-centric way. You define your POJOs. You define your uh, repository or you extend the repository interface. You define there what kind of methods you want to do. It has a lot of magic behind it as well that you can they can infer the kind of ty data types and the kind of fields that you want to store based on the definition of the POJOs. It's all great. And you basically need to do two things, which is define your interface. In, this, in my case, it would be user repository, which is great. And here I can implement all my goody overriding some of the methods like finding, storing, saving, inserting, all of those things. And then I just need to define my class, in this case, my user class, which will have an ID. I need to annotate the primary key. That's mandatory. The rest, it will infer. It also can override the default definition would be, OK, my field, when I have a, uh, an object in my class, which is first name, I'm actually going to be naming it differently in the database. So it kind of handles this very, very well. But you end up with the, this kind of structure, which is not as extremely fancier than the ones that we can do from using the driver directly, for example. It's, it gives you plain documents, which is good, but it doesn't solve all those problems that we were talking about, like different data structures, different data types, all of those things that, that you need to handle that on the application as well. So yes, um, we are also restricted by, you need to do all the data type validations out of the box. You need to make sure that once you're storing something or changing something in your code on your POJOs, those will be re directly reflected into code immediately. So if you want to do some kind of refactoring of your code in, in changing a string to an integer, you're probably going to need to do a migration to do that and change it on the database. Then we have Morphia, it has a different approach. It's data source centric, which means that you'll define a data source and you'll, in almost the same way, you'll define the data source, you tell it which package of POJOs or DAOs or whatever you're using you want to map. In my case, I put in here examples, ODMs, more few POJOs. This is a package where I'm going to put all my classes, all my POJOs that will manipulate by the database. I'll define the data store and how I want to connect to it. Good thing is that it's using directly our driver, without, or if you have a better driver, and if it just extends MongoDB client, you can use them. It's great. I don't know too many in, in Java, but they exist. And you just call the function when you want to use it to store. Great, you define what kind of entity you want to use, like the collection. You can also have the overriding of, of the different fields, if I want to name them differently, and so on. So what's the difference between these two? Well, Morphia goes a little bit further and tells it exactly what's the class in Java that this object refers to. So if I have different polymorphic objects going to the database, like users Spain, and they have some kind of attributes, or users France, or users Portugal, because it's the best country in the world, and wherever I want as a different morphic polymorphic kind of structures. I knew this was going to happen. I don't think that is. That's my problem. So, so when you have this variability that Java actually allows you to do, you can re rely on the classes to immediately load them. Actually, the, the, um, the class, the Morphia, will do it for you. You still need to deal with the different variations inside of each interface, but it's much, much faster extendable to do it in the global scope.
So if I want to change the version of something, I can just create a new interface that implements or extends a previous one and just add up there my changes. And it will be reflected on the class level. So better, better class loading for support also has all the fields optimizations, data mappings, all those things can be handled by Morphia. There's no problem there. And it does good, have a good support for object polymorphism. All right, so ODMs do not solve all our problems. Actually, they add up a new layer of complexity on top of it. So you probably need to have some rules for data management because it's not the same thing to change a data type or a variable name and on an annotation that no one noticed than in the object class. So it, generally, it's a good solution for abstraction, but it's not a good solution for data management because it doesn't really solve too much of those problems. So we're probably going to need something like versioning. We have to tag our documents to tell them what kind of version they have. And they are not only the case of, well, I know I have to deal with changes, but there are also business reasons or business logic reasons that I'll probably need versions. Like, for example, for historical uh, purposes. I want to keep track of all the changes that happen in a class or in an object. Uh, I want to know how this evolves. I want to be able to go back and replay all the different states of my data during time, depending on the code that evolved. So can you use it for flow control, data and field multiversion requirements and archiving and historical purposes? So let's go for the simplest uh, uh, strategy possible. You have a field, an internal field to your document, and you monotonically grow that. Simple. Version zero is the first version of our class. Every time we update something, we just keep on adding the, a new, incrementing that field and that field again. So if we have a workflow like a class that needs to store some data from a form from the web and we don't have all the information, but we want to store it, boom, we have it. The guy adds up his last name, boom, we had it. Increase the version. The guy changes something, adds another field, all right, new, the new version is done. So this field is going to be the one that is going to be controlling how the document will evolve. And if you want to, from an operational perspective, this can be done immediately on the update. Just need to increment, you just need to increment that value. MongoDB offers you an atomic operator for doing that, so you have also concurrency control there. Great. Also, I have the second option is to store a full document every time something changes. Now, for this, we cannot rely on the underscore ID to make sure that we have a unique value for it. We need to store like a document ID or some other kind of identifier of this class. And we keep on adding new documents as we grow in terms of complexity of the document. We had another one and another one, but we still increased the version because that's important to know which is the latest version of, that we are looking for. So we still have the, the version and we also have to deal with the document ID that is there. Okay? If we want to find the latest version, we just need to find for the same identifier, this one, and order and sort it to get the latest one. Simple, right? has a commitment in terms of space, we'll be occupying a lot more information, but we are able to go back and replay every single step of the way that our entity has been suffering. There are another option like to store everything in a big, big document, like I have the current version and I have all the previous versions of the documents. So every time I do some change, what I do is at the current, I'll change the attributes, I'll iterate the version and I'll just had to set to an array all the previous states. Now, this is a little bit more complex, but it can be all done in an atomic fashion. I recover the document, do some manipulation, then I store all the changes together with the current version. That's the flexibility that, you know, these databases will offer you. To find those documents, well, it's always the same identifier, so I'm, I'm good with that. I can filter to just get the current version. All works well. 
Option three is to probably have using collections to control states. I'll have a current collection and a previous versions collection. Here I can add up the different versions of the documents. This will not be stored in my current collection. They will be moved to a previous state collection. And this will be the one that I'll be com constantly just setting up. I'll increment it, I'll do exactly the same operations, but I'm going to keep the collection with the historical versions of this document. Verify that I have a change here where I'm using a different value for storing the unique identifier of the current version. It's the only way that I can keep track of everything that happened. So I need to, if I want to know the current state, I just go to my users. If I want to know everything that happened before, I do go to users past, and I have all that data. So there's a lot of different, yeah. So you, since the document is flexible, you can manipulate them, change the names, set the values, set the fields. You can do anything. That you can replace the documents if you want to. That wouldn't be a problem. The structure is what you define per each update that you do. We have operators that allow you to do and just change the particular fields that exist by its values, but you can also apply a full update of the document and just being replaced by a new one. What you need to guarantee is that once you are updating this, or this, you, you're setting up this thing here, either by updating or replacing the document, you need to make sure you keep it on the previous version. And there are a couple of mechanisms to do that. You can use the op log to do that. There's all different strategies on how exactly from Java you can do that. But in terms of the actual state, the current state, this can either be, I'm going to add up these new two new fields, or I can just replace the document. It's much more efficient, obviously, to replace them and increment this value here. Okay? Much more efficient. Because you don't have to transport all the document from the application back to the database and get a confirmation back. You just say, oh, this new two fields have happened. Increment this version counter. There you go. Okay? But yes, compared with the relational database, you don't have the restriction of, I need to change the structure. I need to go and do an alter table all the time. So this is a grid of what happens and what's the advantages and what kind of things. Yeah. Here, for example, I can just increment it and set this last. So let me replay that a little bit. So we start with this document. And then we add a, a new change. And we increment this value. And then we have this new change, and we increment this other value. What do you mean increment? I mean, something that means that we have already a lot of data. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that I would run a process to update all the data? No. On the update itself, I can go into the document and say, you can't see this well. Um, yeah, yeah. Look into the uh, slide share afterwards, sorry. But this is an operator that increments a numeric value that I have on the database, which is v. So whatever value that is, I'm incrementing by the value of 1. So if the version was 10, if I run this and set the new fields, there will be v equals 11 with the new field set. No, 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 no. Just when writes up happen. Because when I'm accessing data, I'm just reading. But when I'm changing something, like changing a value or changing the structure. Oh, or changing the value. Yes. About it. Sure. Why not? Does it count as a version change? Uh, the is how to Define the version. If a version change is just a structural change, then I increment it. If it's not, if it's just a swap of a value, then I'll leave it. But it depends on how you handle that from the logical uh, from the application. This is the most aggressive approach, is that if I change the first name of Juan to, um, I don't know, Norberto, if you, if, you, if you like the name, well, 
then if my if what I want to do is track all changes on the entity and not on the structure, then the version would need to be up. But if I'm only uh, want to care about how am I going to load this effectively into the application, then I will not need to do that because it will be the semantics of the database that we allow to change values. Okay? But yes, you can choose those. No? There you go. So, it's a lot of information here, but basically what I'm trying to capture is if I'm going for one of these strategies, what, I'm, what are the trade-offs in terms of fetch only one, fetch many, update them all, or recover and fail, if fail? The best of all will be to separate this with a trade-off of recovering and uh, how to manage fail, the failover. The fastest of all will be the embed do single document, although the updates will be taking longer because the documents will grow and they will be need to move, but it will make give us a lot more structure. And the simplistic of all is the increment one value, but it doesn't give me it doesn't give us the full spec of the historical approach or the historical uh, structure changes that happen on a, a particular document. All right, so we get into migrations. Migrations are usually done for these things: add and remove fields change field names, for example, change field data types, or extract embed documents into a collection, for example. And then remove fields, this is our bread and butter. This is as easy as operating, uh, of doing this. So if I want to extend to a new field with a new value, the only thing I need to do is usually utilize this set operator with a new value in the new field. And if I want to remove anything, I can do also unset. This in MongoDB is atomic operation, works very well, it's our bread and butter. There's no need to a migration here, you can do it programmatically. But if you want to change this in all of them, you can also do this with this. Changing the field names, like I don't like first name, I want to do first and last. Well, there's also an operator, it's called rename, that I'll tell it what's the new field value looking like. Okay, I don't want it to be called first name, I just want it to be called first, operate the rename. I can also embed this in my code. If I just want to programmatically, as I access data, if it's called first name, okay, I'll just up update that and rename it, that's it. There's no dramatic transformation there, but I also can operate this in, in a big migration. Changing field type data types might be a little more aggressive because we need to validate that the previous version exists, what's the state of all that? Well, that might be a little more challenging. You have an int that I want to become a string. I can do it on a batch process, I can do it on an aggregation framework execution, and I can do it also based on the change of the application. If I access the data, I'll change it. If I don't access the data, I don't change. Now, if I want to do it programmatically, I can write the script like this. Uh, where I'm going to have a data format that I want to transform to. I will have a list of elements that I want to update. Don't forget, I'm going to use one thing here, which is the bulk API of MongoDB. I can just express thousands and thousands of operations and just send it all in one bulk operation. So to avoid the round trip for each one of the rows that I want to change or each one of the documents that I want to change, I can do that all by once. So what I do, I do it in, in a batch process. I'll create the list, I'll set the, the transformation that I want to do, I'll add them to a list of updates, and then I call the bulk write operation. Simple, just flies through. And operates on per each row, per each document, but all at once. Now, is this efficient? And this is the only part that we're going to see code at almost five o'clock in the afternoon when beers are waiting. So is this efficient? Imagine I have a million documents in my database. If I'm going to do a full table scan, because this call.find will do a full table scan, will that be efficient? Probably not. This will give me a cursor, I'll have to iterate over the cursor, but that's not gonna be a lot of efficiency. Also because then I need to build a huge one million row array 
list in Java. Everyone likes that, right? So there's a couple of efficiencies that we can do. We can set a limit, we can sort it differently, and so on. But also, I can also specify that I don't want to change things which are already in the right format. And there's also operators in MongoDB that allows us to filter based on the data type that the field represents. So in this case, for example, if birth dates is already type 16, which is the integer, it's the, my final state that I want the data to be in, I want them to filter out. And this way I'll just eliminate all the changes that, are, and I can parallelize this process into different threads, and then each one of them will do chunks of the data. So instead of having to, one process to process 1 million, I might have 10 processes that process 100,000 and scale that out to several different machines. But it will be filtered. Anything that's already been changed, I'll skip it. I just want the new ones that have not been changed by the data type. Just a tweak on the execution story. Extracting documents into collections, that's easy. I have these documents. I want to extract the cat pictures into their own separate collection. Well, I want to transform this into different documents, two different collections. What I want to do is, you can't see that well, I'm sorry. You aggregate, you run unwind. The unwind on an array will give me an individual document for each element of that array. I'll project it and tell it how it, I want it to look like. I want to filter out some, some information. I want to filter out that underscore ID because that is referring to the previous uh, collection. Put it in UID, which is referring back to the user collection, and just remove it. And I'll express it to each collection that I want to store it. In this case, cats. Great. When I run this, I'll have two different data sets, one with all the cat pictures, pointing back to the user that has created it, or the owner of that picture, and then I can unset the, this field, cat pictures, and then I am over. Great. This works all in sharded, parallelized, takes its time, but it's, it's efficient enough. All right, so I'm almost there. We're almost in beers. Bear with me a little bit. Trade-offs, decoupled architectures. I don't see any penalties on it. It's great, it's scalable, allows you to have a clean solution for your data architecture, should be applied by default in all your projects. If you're going for data structures with high variability, it reflects nowadays use cases. We tend to have a lot of need to store unstructured or semi-structured data, so be aware of that. You can push decisions for later as well. If you have a flexible schema, you don't need to decide already what the schema is going to look like. You can decide further on and optimize with the migrations, the transactions, the versioning, all that. It's more complex code base. Your data, your data manipulation layer will need to understand the different colors and shapes and, and sounds and, and things that your database will have. So you're probably going to have to have more elaborate database factories that will transform a cursor into objects and those objects into a business model. If you look for data structure strictness, you can also use it in MongoDB or a flexible schema, but you'll probably be restricting your iterations. Every time you're going to do a change, you will have to do a migration of that data. It might be a little bit more bulkier, but simpler to maintain and align, always align with your code, a la relational system, basically. As a recap, use them both together. Probably Java is the, um, the uh, driver that is mostly used across the world and with MongoDB combined. It's also a reflection of the vast importance and the number of complex architectures that we have and projects that we have in Java world. It's far bigger than, at least here in Spain, for example, it's far bigger than any other language, even .NET. So, Use it wisely. Uh, it's there to solve a lot of problems. Don't try to fit everything into a single collection. That might probably not be a good idea. Make sure that if you are using a flexible schema, you are aware that the complexity increases on your code, but also it enables you to better test it and to better control it. If you want to learn more, and this you don't see well, but you probably don't want to see because it starts August 4th. It's our usual, um, or our classic, going to be for Java developers. It's a great course, great content, everyone likes it. If you are 
thinking about learning a little bit further how to use Java and MongoDB, it's a right way to start, it's the ideal point to start. It's during the vacation, I'm not sure you are very interested in learning stuff like MongoDB, but hey, if you are in between breaks of pool and paella and parrillada, perfecto. If you want to learn a little bit more, if you have questions around how all this can be architectured very, very well, I am more than available and happy to answer any of your questions. Troll me on Twitter, spam me on my Gmail, everyone does that. So thank you so much and has, let's have a beer or two.